So you're almost welcome to this further ASME bite-sized session. Um, the session today is on back to reality, reality television as an adjunct to CBL. And importantly, this is an EDC prize winning project. Um, so just a brief introduction. I'm Colin McDowell. I'm head of medical education at Warwick Medical School. Um, and until a couple of weeks ago, I was the chair of ASME EDC. And I've got a couple of housekeeping things to do before I tell you a little bit about the project and hand you over to the team that's presenting this evening. So in terms of housekeeping, will be a uh, session will last about 45 minutes. Um, I'd be grateful if you could use the chat field for any questions you have. We'll leave questions to the end and I'll be collating those a little bit if there are common themes, but do stick things in the chat throughout the presentation as we go. Um, and please make sure that the chat set to being to all panelists and attendees for your comments so that everyone can see what you've posted uh, rather than being just to an individual or to the panelists. Um, also importantly, this webinar is being recorded so that people can watch it afterwards, including obviously yourselves. Another key thing is if there is a technical problem, uh, please email events at asme.org.uk. And if you look at the chat, you'll see that I've dropped um, that into the chat for any technical issues and they will get back to you directly rather than putting it in the chat. So that's the housekeeping. In terms of, of today, I, th I think what we've got today is, is exciting, innovative, and most importantly, as I mentioned earlier, already prize winning. Um, this prize, what this pr um, topic won the uh, ASME EDC Education Innovation Award. And I think it'll become clear pretty quickly that what we're presenting uh, today is very COVID relevant in terms of the world we're now living in, but importantly, it actually all happened and won the prize before COVID even existed. Um, so it was already an innovative um, idea at that point. Before handing on, I will say just a couple of things about ASME prizes. Uh, most importantly, there are a lot of ASME prizes. And again, I've dropped into the chat uh, the link to the uh, ASME prize webpage. Um, EDC itself administers two prizes, the Education Innovation Award and the Educator Development Award, but there are many, many other prizes. And if you're ever short of cash to do something innovative or interesting in education or to help develop yourself, or you think you've done something great and you want the world to know about it, do have a look at the ASME web pages and find the appropriate prize. In terms of the two prizes that EDC um, awards, tonight you're hearing something about education innovation, and that's a prize that highlights, promotes, and disseminates innovation. And importantly, it provides funding to do stuff. So if you've got a good idea and you want to get on with it, but need some cash to help you, this is the prize to look for. Uh, the other prize we administer is the Educator Development Award, which is quite unusual and, and, and quite unique in terms of prizes because it's an award for people to develop themselves. And although it's lovely if you then tell other people um, and disseminate, actually it's about an individual developing themselves as an educator, no matter what their stage of development is so far. So that's the background. That's a little bit about awards. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Fiona Osborne and team, all from the Northeast, to tell you a bit more about virtual reality and its place in CBL. Thank you very much. So we'll just do a quick round of introductions. I'm Fiona, I'm a paediatric trainee by background, and I'm currently a teaching and research fellow at Northumbria, and I'm in my second year of doing a PhD in medical education. My name is Belinda Bateman. I'm a jobbing paediatrician up in Northumbria as well, which is tucked in the northeast of England. And um, until very recently, I was child health lead for Newcastle University undergraduate medical degree. Hi, I'm Miles Harrison. I'm currently an anaesthetics trainee in the Northern Deanery um, and I've worked with Belinda and Fiona um, at Northumbria Healthcare as a teaching fellow for about 18 months. Um, yeah. 
Perfect. So I thought an interesting way to kick things off would be to do a quick poll of our attendees just to gauge the experience level of people using reality television as part of teaching. So it looks like there's at least one person who's had experience of using reality television and teaching. Um, that's great. It'd be super to hear at the end actually about your own experience and what you think of what we've done and how that compares actually. Great. So if we'll we close that down just now. Um, we started using reality television a couple of years ago now in the Northeast, and it started really when Miles and I were asked to design a teaching session to address acute paediatric outcomes. Um, we recognised there was a bit of a challenge in our district general hospital for students to get experience of acute and or rare presentations. Um, I absolutely believe that the best way to learn is through real clinical experience in practice, but you are aligned in a way for what comes through the door. And also what our students fed back to us is that sometimes they struggle to be included in sensitive situations such as managing death. So Miles and I were also a little bit conscious that even when students really grasp the theory of something, there can be a bit of a disconnect when trying to put that into practice. So to use a recent example, um, my students could recite back perfectly the WHO pain ladder, so looking at different pain treatments, but when they were presented with a child in acute pain clinically, it was like it kind of all went out the window and they really didn't know what to do. So I think that's where reality television can actually be really useful as a bridge between theory and real clinical practice. I think you get those really powerful audio and visual cues and also I think it appeals to something in us as humans learning from other stories. So we've seen already that we're not the only people to be using reality television as part of teaching, but what I think is possibly unique is in the way that we did that. So we used a series of clips to represent a patient journey and we integrated that with paper-based cases. And at each stage of the patient journey as events unfolded, we asked students to complete um, different clinical tasks. So in a way they were treating the patient that they were seeing on the screen. And I'd like to introduce to you a really useful educational theory which we based our sessions around. I'm gonna try now to share a graphic which hopefully will help to explain this. Hold on a wee second. So this is the theory of anchored instruction and it was developed by Bransford and the Cognition and Technology Group in Vanderbilt in the 90s. And the principle was that students are exposed to a multi-dimensional problem and often it was video footage that they used and they were then asked to do authentic tasks in relation to that problem. So for us, it was the reality TV clips which were the problem and then the tasks were clinical things such as prescribing, requesting investigations or communication scenarios. And the theory is that by addressing these problems in context, students are helped to develop useful knowledge um, rather than what the authors call inert knowledge. So they're putting that into practice. Um, so if you think about my example before, actually seeing a patient in pain and then prescribing that painkiller for them. So just now to provide a little bit of background of how we structure the sessions. So we had one case, which was an acute seizure scenario, and we used clips from 24 hours in A&E, which followed the journey of a little one-year-old girl who has a prolonged febrile convulsion. And first of all, the students see this little girl being brought into the A&E recess area. And um, she's pale, she's lifeless, and has the really distraught parents with her and the students are, have to pick up on quite subtle clinical cues. So in this case, we want them to pick up on the fact that the wee girl is still having a seizure, she's still fitting. And that's just a very subtle movement of the eyes in that case. And then we ask the students to prescribe an appropriate treatment to manage the condition. And we hope that they're prescribing something suitable like IV lorazepam. And then after that, we can actually show them a video clip of the impact of having given that treatment. So in this case, the little girl develops respiratory depression and actually requires bag mask ventilation. So the students can see the impact of the treatment they've prescribed. 
And to me, that was just a really powerful way to learn and actually quite different to when we run the similar scenario in our simulation center um, where you're rehearsing the same protocol, but with instead of video, you've got this like high tech mannequin vibrating to represent the seizure. So um, I've spoken for quite a bit now and I'd like to hand over to Belinda, who was the child health lead for the medical school at the time that we were developing this session. And I think it's going to talk about how it fitted in with the curriculum. Hi, everybody. So um, we used it in three different areas of the curriculum, really. So as um, Fiona was talking about to start with, we used it in our final year, our fifth year child health curriculum. And um, really enabling the students to have relatively real social and clinical contexts for the tasks that we were asking them to complete. And then um, I guess we didn't just hope that they prescribed the ivylorazepam, we did check that they had managed to and supported them to change medication if necessary or change the way they prescribed. We then moved through to our final year of adult medicine surgery block, which is called hospital-based practice in Newcastle. And um, that was the subject of our research. So we managed to um, look at the impact of, of, the, um, of this session, partly with um, observation. So Miles and I um, took observation notes while the session was on, underway. And then Miles also, also interview, interviewed a small group of students about their, their, their feelings about the session. And then finally, we took the opportunity of um, the, a new curriculum that was roll, rolling out in Newcastle. And, um, and Newcastle's a regional medical school. And the trust really had, had, had de uh, developed materials independently to date, but it, this enabled us to produce some materials that could be used across the trust in the region and certainly used in... Um, parallel with a simulation session. So we were able to kind of divide the learning outcomes between the two sessions appropriately, I hope. And um, the feedback from, from around the region has been really positive, that, that, that they were useful materials that they could adapt to their own teaching style and their, their own size of groups. So I'll now hand you back to Miles and Fiona, who are going to show you some clips and talk a little bit about how, how we did it in practice. Cheers. So what we're going to do now is work through a case that is very similar to ones that we did with the students. So at the start of the session, we'd introduce ourselves, introduce the team. So I'd be, I'm Miles, I'm an anaesthetic trainee. I'm going to be working with Fiona today, who's a paediatrics trainee, and we're going to work through some video cases with you. We'd explain, as we've said, that we're going to show clips, give tasks, show further clips and work through the progression. And additionally, what we would do is we'd give the students a little task booklet which had extra information in it about the patient. So it might have observations, it might have investigation results, it might have x-ray results, things that you would get in real life that may not be shown necessarily in the clip. Um, and then we would give them any stationery that they would need. So if they needed to write up a drug card X, we'd make sure that one was uh, provided for them as well. Then what we'd do is um, we'd start the clips um, and introduce them. So what we're going to do now is we're going to show you a clip of a young lad called George. He's 16 years old and he sustained a head injury. And what we're going to do is we're going to work through that case with you the way that we would with the students now. So what you've seen there is George, um, he's been brought into the District General Hospital um, and you can see that he's sustained a head injury. Now, at this point, we'd say to the students things like, okay, so you're one of the foundation doctors that's working in that emergency department. What do you think you might be doing to prepare for that trauma call that's coming in? Um, who else might need to be phoned? What other team members might need to be present? So it's things like that you can talk through because quite often when they're in the emergency department, they don't have time to talk through those things because they're preparing and reacting ready for those cases. It's quite nice to have the time to talk through that. Other practical little things is that the red phone's gone off in A&E and actually what is that red phone? And it's a direct link to the ambulance service. Students sometimes don't know that because it's the practical things that don't necessarily get taught in the classroom. And sometimes you don't always understand when you're working in practice. And then we'd often give them a little task to do. So quite often in paediatrics, you calculate the drug doses for the child that's coming in before they arrive so that you've got them ready. So a task that we could give the students at this point would be calculate the emergency drug doses for the patient that's coming in and give them um, little, little forms to prescribe them on ready for the patient arriving. 
So Fiona's going to take you through the next part of the clip now, uh, and I'll just show you the next bit. So in that clip, we heard from George's father and his stepmother talking about his collapse and then his condition afterwards. And at this point, I asked our students to imagine that they're in the a &E recess and George has been brought in and they have to look after him. And as Miles said, it can be quite useful to provide some extra clinical details to what's seen on the screen. So either and verbally and or in the paper cases. So I'd probably tell them at this point, imagine George is brought in, his GCS was 10, but over about 10 minutes it improves 15. The team examine him and they don't find any focal neurology, but they do find that he's got a boggy swelling in the left temporal parietal area. Um, at this point, we just say to the students, can you request uh, the most appropriate imaging to manage George? And we'd hope that they'd request something like a CT head. Um, we'd give them time to complete that task and then get them to feedback. And it's an opportunity to talk through what would be a model and um, request form to justify the scan to the radiologist. So things might be the mechanism of injury, the serial GCS scores, the exam findings. Um, and really quite interestingly, what often stumps them is the very minor things that aren't included in the textbook. So for our request forms, it asks the students to say whether the patient will travel down to scan um, by walking in a chair, in a bed or in a trolley. And this stumps them. They're like, oh, what is a trolley? Um, and you can have these discussions about the real practical elements of requesting results. Uh, sorry, requesting investigations. And once we'd finished that, we'd say, Let's see the next clip and what happens to George now. So the other useful aspect of using the video clips is that we can discuss about communication skills. Um, so we discuss with the students here, how do you think the news was broken? Um, what do you think that the doctor there did well? Maybe what do you think could be improved upon? And it's really useful because it's not just us acting a role play out in front of them. It's actually seeing this is a real doctor and this is how they broke the news. Um, and it gets them to think about how they could do that in real life when they're working as foundation year doctors. Um, tasks that we would quite often associate with this is we talk through kind of discussing things, breaking bad news, and then we could give them a role play that's based on this scenario. So we'd say, okay, so what we'd like to do is pair up. One of you um, will be the parents and we give them a little vignette so that you've got a bit of background and some questions to ask. And then we'll get one of you to act as the doctor. And we want you to break the same news that's been broken and see how you could go about doing that and finding words that you find good. And the team that was facilitating the session would move around and we could be there to help answer questions. We could listen in to different students and the way they were doing it so that we could kind of support them through that. And it was really good for practicing those communication skills. And then what we'd say is, OK, so now we've we've done that, we've explained the findings to them. Um, let's continue with the, the story of George. I have seen that clip so many times, but it still always gets me. Um, so in that clip, we saw the neurosurgeon explain to George that he would need surgery. And then the emotional moment where George is on the phone to his mum and talking about that he's afraid that he's not going to make it through the surgery. And I think with your students at this point, you'd want to debrief with them about how they're feeling. And I think there's a real opportunity here to address the emotional aspects of being a doctor. And you might want to bring in one of your own experiences. So I might talk about a time recently where I've looked after a teenager who's been in real acute distress. And there's lots of clinical uh, tasks you could set to this. You could do, for example, working through the consent paperwork, and then you could have a discussion around the laws around consent, um, particularly with young people and in emergencies. So I'm afraid that's only the last clip we've got time for, but. I, we, what we found um, from running this is that it's really important to give um, people closure. So I can tell you that George actually does make it through his surgery. And after four days, he is out of hospital and has no long term problems. So um, 
that was a case which had a really happy ending. Um, but we had to have had cases where the patients don't make it, which is realistic. And actually, sometimes they're the most powerful learning moments. And we had one really memorable teaching session, actually, where a lot of the students and in fact, the staff were brought to tears because of it. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Belinda now to talk about that emotional um, element of learning through the cases. Hi again. So Miles and I were observers of one of the um, adult sessions and um, we watched a clip where there were two sisters who lost their, I can't remember if it was their mum or their dad now, but they, they'd lost their, their parents anyway. And um, yeah, it was really sad. And I think we, Miles and I were both independently observed that the students had a very social experience of, of feeling that and expressing that emotional investment in the clip of the people they were watching. And we're able to discuss the communication skills of the doctor, which certainly weren't perfect, but I think we're able to discuss them with, with a degree of reality about the demands on that doctor at that time, which was, was really useful. So a real social experience of learning and a, and a real definite investment of emotions was interesting, useful. So I'll now pass you on to Fiona, who will tell you a little bit more about our research findings. So what she did with Miles and my field notes and, and the interviews that Miles did. Great, thank you, Belinda. So we wanted to explore the use of reality television and teaching a bit further. And we did this through a case study based research investigation. And as Belinda's mentioned, we triangulated the findings from the field note, field note observations of the teaching session that was observed and also qualitative interviews with a sample of the students. And our focus was on looking at the emotional learning and, and experience of learning in this way, and also the extent to which it helps students identify their learning needs in the clinical environment. So from the, our analysis, we came up with several themes. I'm just going to talk quite briefly about four of them. So first of all, um, the students all reported that they found this much more memorable and realistic than a paper-based case. They felt much more engaged with doing the task that we'd set. Um, really interestingly, one participant said that although they knew what they were doing wasn't going to impact a real patient, they still felt much more invested in doing it and doing it properly. And the participants described imagining themselves in the role of the doctor. And I think through kind of the messy clinical reality, they were able to identify gaps in their own learning. So things that came up were some simple things like, how do you prescribe fluzamide? And what do you do when a patient's got SVT, but actually the drugs aren't working? And then on a kind of different note, that what do you do when the patient you're looking after dies, you know, the practical and emotional elements. So as hopefully you've experienced from the scenario we've just run, these clips can have a real emotional di dimension um, and the participants all commented on this explicitly and they spoke about how it made them feel more connected with the patients that they were watching. Um, one participant said that it gave them an idea of what it would feel like to get to know a patient and look after them and for them then to pass away. And I think as we've seen, um, you get some really candid footage of patients and their families. And I think that's perhaps why students were really reflective about the importance of practicing holistic care. And they were quite struck, for example, when there's a case of an a &E doctor breaking bad news in the middle of a busy a &E floor. So I could really talk for ages about these findings. I thought it was really fascinating, I am biased. Um, we have written a paper which we're hoping will be published very soon. So if you're interested to learn more, um, we can direct you towards that. But I'm sure, I hope some of you are interested in learning a bit more about the practicalities of how we did it. So I'm going to hand over to Miles now, who's going to talk, talk through some top tips for teaching with reality TV. Thank you. So you've kind of seen now how the session works. Um, and I've seen there's a few questions in the chat function as well. Um, so hopefully um, I'll be able to answer a couple of those as we go through our top tips. Um, so with regards to the top tips, we had a few different ones. So 
Firstly, how to find videos. I think on a practical aspect, what we did was we used something called the learning on screen resource. So quite a number of UK institutions are signed up to, to use this. You might not even know that your institution signed up to it. So if you go to learningonscreen.ac.uk, it's there. You put the institution that you're working from and sign in just using your university login. And this means that you don't then have to get permission from producers or contact people individually. Um, because they've all got rights there that's already been signed up to, to be able to use any clips that's on this and it's got thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of TV. As you've also seen with the clip that we showed you of George, you can use YouTube as well um, because they're free to access. Uh, you just can't edit any of those clips that are on YouTube. However, with the Learning On Screen resource, um, if your institution signed up to it, you can search for things. Um, most of the episodes have been transcribed. So we searched for things like aneurysm, and then it popped up with all the shows that said aneurysm. We could choose the shows we wanted, skip through the clips, skip to the bit where it says it. So it saved us quite a lot of time. The other benefit of this is it actually allowed us to cut and edit clips down to short, sort of 30 second and minute bite-sized bits that we could then add together. Um, YouTube was really, really good, but it didn't allow us to do that. Um, and this allowed us to do it without having to get any extra information from producers or anything or get any extra rights. Um, then once you've done them, you can save them here um, and continually reuse them, which was really, really useful. So when we're going through it, creating a case, we started to ask ourselves a few key questions. So when we're choosing our cases, we firstly said, what conditions do the students need to see? So we looked at the log books, we looked at their outcomes for the year and said, okay, so these are the, the things that they need to do by the end of third year or final year. Let's have a look and see which ones of these we think we can do something with. Once we'd picked the ones out that we thought would be useful, we actually thought, well, will they see it easily elsewhere? Is this a really common condition that they're guaranteed to see when they come through the emergency department? Or is it something that we teach them loads on in simulation? So rather than repeating the same things, let's teach them things that maybe they're not gonna have as much access to. Then we asked ourselves, what do I want them to learn from this case? So it gave us quite a lot of freedom to pick and choose different cases so that we could design different sessions. But it also allowed us to then think, well, do I want them just to learn the management? Or as we've said, do we want them to learn about the more holistic approach of breaking bad news, breaking a diagnosis to a patient? And actually, we can incorporate lots of these different layers into the cases. So these were some of our adjustments that we made down. Then we thought, is it the best method of teaching this condition? So Fiona mentioned that we do a session on status epilepticus um, in the sim suite, but we also did a video clip as well. And the practical aspect of dealing with it in real time is more suited to a simulation centre, whereas this allowed us to actually look at the specifics of actually what a child looks like when they're seizing and actually how they act after they've had the, the benzodiazepines. So think about how you're delivering it and is it the best method and whether it fits into the curriculum better here or somewhere else. And then is there a video? So sometimes we go through all these things and it takes a little bit of time, but normally we've been able to find a video that allows us to, to work through all the things that we've found. Sometimes we have to tweak the, the tasks that we give the students, but normally there's quite a lot we can tweak out of bringing their videos. And then finally, as Fiona said earlier, sort of closing the loop and having a progression through the patient journey. That's why we quite like 24 hours in A&E because it shows them coming into the hospital progressing through the journey and then it shows the patient outcome at the end whether that's a good outcome and the patient improves and goes home or whether it's one where the patient passes away it's still really useful for the um, students to see it because it closes that loop and it's more mirrors real life what happens with patients when we were thinking about our tasks we had to think quite carefully as well because you need to align what's on the screen with what is um the task that you're giving the students. So you need to make sure that if you've got somebody that's having an asthma attack, you're asking them about asthma, you're not asking them about a different condition, so COPD or something. Make sure the two mirror up. And it sounds a bit silly, but sometimes students are able to pick up little differences um, that are kind of on screen to what you're doing. Something we noticed in that was that actually we teach kind of the gold standard. This is how you should do things. And sometimes that differs from how things are done in real life and you do see that picked up on the video clip. So just be careful with your tasks. And if you do see differences between how you're teaching it and how it's done on screen, explain why there's differences so the students understand. Something else we thought was think kind of outside the box. Um, it doesn't just have to be prescribing or role plays. One of the patients that we had, as Fiona said earlier, passed away and it had quite an emotional response. 
but it opened up quite a lot of conversations about death and dying and it opened up conversations about what you do to verify patient deaths and although it wasn't practical we were able to talk about that with the students how you'd verify a patient's death so then we decided that we'd get them to do a death certificate and complete that it was much more useful for them because they'd seen the patient and they understood what was going on for them and then they were able to complete it rather than just saying put these things in the boxes they thought about the cause of death and actually how they would go about filling this in which is something they would be doing in you know less than 12 months time as a foundation doctor our final tip was use your multidisciplinary faculty. Now, I can't kind of overestimate this. This is really, really useful to have an MDT faculty in the room. So when we did the sessions, we had a mixture of people from different backgrounds. So mine was kind of anaesthetics, Fiona's pediatrics, um, but we also had adult medics for the adult medicine sessions. We had pharmacists that came in and did it with us. Um, we had nurses, we had pediatric nurses. We had loads of different faculty. And the reason I've included this little picture here is because it's a screenshot of one of the cases that we did. And you can just see from this very brief screenshot that there's at least three different members of staff that are there. So you've got the, the gentleman in blue that I think is a healthcare, the dark blue is the sister, and then the, the doctor in the background. But it was really handy to have these other team members in the room because they were to explain what they'd be doing in the situation and actually what they could do and what they couldn't do. So when the students say, oh, well, I get the nurse to do this, the nurse could say, oh, actually, no, we're not able to do that you know that's so and so that can do that and we can discuss things it also allowed us to discuss different things that would happen um on the wards that maybe the students didn't think about so with regards to the patient that passed away sometimes people write may they rest in peace and the doctors would do that in the notes and the nurses might open the window so little things that happen on the wards and why people do them it was really really useful to have those um, conversations in the room um I'm going to hand you back over to Fiona now because I went back to full-time clinical in February just as COVID was kicking off. Um, so I've not had that much experience in actually using this during the era of COVID. Um, but Fiona's going to talk through a few tips that we've learned from using it um, when COVID's been happening. Perfect. So thanks, Miles. I'm sure many of you have had the joy and challenge of delivering teaching sessions a bit differently because of COVID. So our reality TV sessions have either been partly or fully online um, to cope with that. And actually, I think the good news is that it does lend itself really well for remote teaching. Um, my tips would be for doing that, as with everything, to test out the technology beforehand. Um, so making sure that you're sharing both the video and the audio. There's usually an extra tick box you've got to do and I forever forget how to tick that box. So worth practicing beforehand. And just making sure as well that your students at home, if they are at home, have the resources and tools they need to do the tasks and then getting them to feedback to you. So you're not just broadcasting at them. Um, Within the NHS, you can sometimes have difficulties accessing some websites with firewalls, etc. We did have a problem recently when our, our trust changed what they were doing. But the reassuring thing is actually the website that Miles mentioned, the learning on screen, were extremely helpful and within a couple of hours actually sorted out our problem. So even if you think it's, it's not working for you, I would contact the website and they can get that going for you. Um, Speaking about websites, we've actually just launched our own website, um, which is a way for us to share the resources that we've come up with with you. Um, it's just, it can be a bit time consuming developing these. So if you want to take anything that we're using or share your own resources, we'd love for you to um, use our website. Uh, shameless plug there. So Miles is just showing um, the website that, that's there. So it just talks through, you'll see on there the clip we've used today. Um, it talks very briefly about how we used it and um, the format. And then probably most handily, if you can find your way to the resources section, we've got pediatric resources and adult resources, but within those, um, there are the, all the PowerPoints that we used and our teaching packs and our student packs, which you can use for yourself. So please um, check that out if you're interested. So. I'm conscious of time and I really want to hear from you and your questions and comments. So I hope that's been helpful to you. And I'm going to hand back now to Colin to manage a bit of our Q&A. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I already knew a lot about that, but even seeing it 
done that 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 was absolutely fascinating a uh, very and quite emotive case um we've had uh about three questions so far in the chat which we'll kind of go through um i think the first one which is about getting um permission i think you've already covered but if there's any further queries um from the person that asked that do say um so the next one um so from Rachel, which is, I presume you can see the questions as well, but um, around the flexibility of cases, you're of course producing your own cases and, and clearly have some control of the curriculum. I presume this question has been asked from a scenario where someone is perhaps been given cases and then looking to kind of put some sort of virtual reality support wrapper around that. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, so yeah, quite often what we do is we'd look at things that have been in the curriculum before. So when we were planning the new third year curriculum, we'd look at core conditions um, about actually what the students need to know. And that allowed us to maybe tweak some of the cases that had been done previously. Um, I think if you've got a very, very strict pre-written case that you need to do X, Y, and Z, it might be hard unless you can pick up an exact video. Um, but what you could definitely do is take an existing case and adapt it and use um, similar resources that you've got um, and link it to cases. Or you could use the case as a bit of a crutch and then bounce off it to do some of the tasks that you need to and then link back in later. As long as the case that you're using the video you're using makes sense with the tasks that you're giving them and things, then I think it would work. Um, I think it probably would need a bit of tweaking though. And if it's a very, very strict one, um, you might struggle a little bit. Miles, you might want to tell them about the challenge when the case doesn't quite align with the um case on screen and how that kind of confused the students a bit with the the adult with SVT wasn't it I think yeah so sometimes students can get a little bit confused so if things get mentioned in the videos that don't exactly match up with what you're asking them to do task wise um, so there's a patient who had a history of fast AF um, but have come in with an SVT so a supraventricular tachycardia just on their ECG we asked them to manage an acute SVT but the students had heard that they'd had fast AF in the past and it got them a bit confused so just when you're picking up um, clips just make sure that you're you're aligning them very very closely to, to what you're actually asking the tasks of or addressing if there's inconsistencies between the two um, just so the students are aware. Thank you. So we've got another question around uh, looking um, into the psychological safety for learners. I'm wondering if it's possible to answer that in terms of how you used to do it, but obviously how you're now doing it virtually, because I suspect the answer might be subtly different. So I, I hope that actually the way we run the scenarios and around the session, it is a safe space for learners. So of course they could be watching this at home on their couches if they wanted to. Um, but I think the, the benefit is that they're surrounded by their classmates and they have the tutors there. So we do warn students that they might find some of their material emotional. Um, and obviously there's always, we set ground rules. So there's space if they need to leave for any reason, they can do that. And I think that's kind of a fairly standard thing we do with anything sensitive within our teaching sessions. And it's just, um, about having an opportunity to debrief. So when someone's at home, it's a little bit more difficult, but we encourage them to keep their camera on. And um, so then you can at least gauge how they're feeling and just to check in with them regularly. Uh, you know, how do you feel about that? And um, the very, very emotional material we haven't yet done fully online. So that's a good um, thing for me to think about when we run that in January. So it's a really good point. Thank you. I think face to face, we, we thought a little bit through delivering the sessions about how we arrange arrange the room and I think um, if you've got the luxury of a few facilitators then ensuring you've got a facilitator per small group of students enables them both to get immediate feedback about the tasks they're doing um, and ask questions while they're doing it but also I think probably provide somebody to support that group immediately around safety rather than having an eye on the whole group I think. And it also strikes me that actually this is material that they could have just watched, switched on the TV and seen on Channel 4 without support. Indeed, any member of the public could do that. And also that actually you've got a mechanism for support that they would not necessarily have in a busy A&E where they could actually be seeing the real live thing in front of them with, with all of the, the stresses and strains. So although that's clearly an important aspect, you have ways of working through and preparing for, for that as well. So we've got a question about student group size. 
Um, so for the paediatric sessions that we did, um, we had smaller groups. I think the maximum we had was about 12 in those groups. Um, and then for the adult session, um, it was a much larger group. Um, I think there was about 20, which is why we thought it was more useful if you could break the students down into smaller groups um, and arrange the room so that there were kind of maybe four or five to a table so that if there was any discussions, it was, it was more like that rather than a rows and rows of people. Um, it just made it feel a bit more of a community and that they could have a more conversation then. Um, but yeah, we think probably smaller groups is better if you can. And if you can't, then breaking it down into small tables of students. I think it's a balance, isn't it? Of having, we have like a big faculty where we can get it with this multidisciplinary team and mm -hmm. having the whole group together. I mean, they can all benefit from that. I think online it's a bit different and we're actually breaking into smaller groups of, of six maximum because probably those who've taught online in a big group, it can be quite difficult to keep that engagement and interaction. So we're going to just have one tutor per small group for that and probably sadly lose a bit of the MDT element, but um, it's one of those compromises we've decided to make. So thank you very much. Um, if there's, we're pretty much on the dot of time. So we'll pause a little bit just in case any more questions come in. Um, but I would like to thank you. Um, and if there's any final points you want to make, you can do so in a moment. I notice a question has just come in, which we want, want to look at. But just whilst you're looking at that, um, can I just say a couple of things? Um, apart from thank you for everybody, thank you for Lee for running the session. Um, please be aware um, that the video will be available. It will be a few days before it's on the website. Thank you for everyone participating and for questions. Um, and please uh, do look at the up and coming sessions. So the next one is the 25th of November on representation in medicines. So that's not only a couple of days time. Um, details on the website and I'll drop the details into the chat as well. So that's the wrap up. But I do, I think, are we allowed, Lee, just one or two more minutes to cover the the, the question from Susan and the point from Paul. Yeah, go for it, it's fine. Yeah. So I think Susan is, is about the search function um, not yielding anything. So I don't know if you've got any top tips. Um, yeah, I think you have to be logged in to be able to search um, because you've got to be signed up as your institution. Um, so it's probably worth trying to sign in, see if your institution's enrolled. Um, and if it's not, then getting in touch with whoever's in charge with your IT people um, there. Um, just because to have the rights to be able to view the clips, it's your institution that's got to be enrolled to it. And if that doesn't work, then I'm sure um, Miles and Fiona and Linda would be happy to receive questions about the, the practicalities after the session. I, yeah, everyone's nodding. So I think final from Paul, um, sense of students finding differences and challenge between the paediatric and the adult sessions. I think having done both sessions and from a paediatric point of view, they are a little bit different, but in many ways, very similar. So they find it difficult, um, particularly having to do something. And it's that kind of gap between theory and practical knowledge. And I think that was the same in pediatric and adults. So I haven't noticed a huge amount of difference between the sessions and actually the feedback that we get is quite similar from the both these our students go through adult versions and pediatric versions. I need to be careful because Miles will laugh. I keep calling it the adult video session because I think you're the paediatric. That's something very different, but they were, they were quite equivalent. So thank you very much. Um, we did promise to run to time. So we're now a little bit over time. So um, I'm afraid the technology doesn't allow a full or a round of applause, but I will give my personal round of applause even if you can't hear the rest of the audience. I note that our full audience has stayed with us for the entire session, um, which is, uh, uh, a good indicator of the of the interest um, for everyone who has attended the video will be available please tell your friends about it if you found it interesting send them the link um, and lots of people are saying thank you really interesting work um, and uh, uh, lots of appreciative things so thank you very much uh, I do hope everyone's enjoyed this uh, lots of thank yous coming through and uh, I look forward uh, to meeting many of you future and uh, I encourage you all to have a look at future bite size events uh, because uh, there is a whole range and variety of topics. And thank you again, Belinda, Fiona, Miles, for this evening's session. Thank you very much. <laughs>